Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lauren Darren. I am head of clinical education and managing editor for orthopedics at the Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute. And I will be moderating this session on integrating regenerative medicine protocols into your practice. We have people from all over the world joining us today, and it is a great pleasure to have Dr. Ashu Goyal presenting on such an important topic. Dr. Goyle is a distinguished figure in the field of pain management and regenerative medicine, specializing in cutting edge treatments for spine related conditions. Before we get started, I encourage you to send in questions as soon as you have them in the Q&A section, as we will address those throughout the lecture. With that said, it is a great pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Ashu Goyle. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, I need to set up my screen here. Excellent, can you see it okay? Yeah. Thank you everyone for taking time out of your late afternoon or early evening, depending on where you are in the US or across the world, I guess. Um, and we're going to be discussing, introducing regenerative medicine into your practice. Specifically, I wanna focus on some of the benefits of incorporating regenerative medicine into your practice, um, optimizing outcomes for particularly PRP procedures, and then some of my pre and post procedure protocols that uh, further optimize patient outcome when you're uh, regenerative medicine procedures. So my background is in anesthesia and pain management. Um, I did my training at Cleveland Clinic, uh, residency in anesthesiology, and then an interventional spine and pain fellowship. And for the last several years, I've also been uh, taking a deep dive into regenerative medicine and focusing heavily on PRP. So I finished my training in 2007. Uh, my fellowship was heavily interventional spine based and fluoroscopic guided. Um, after about 10 years of private practice, I started getting burnt out on pain management and just medicine in general, as I think most physicians do. Uh, so in 2017, I attended a pain conference in Napa, California, and there was a pre-conference symposium titled Regenerative Medicine. And it was, head by, it was uh, led by one of my now dear close friends, uh, colleagues and mentors, Dr. George Chen Chang Chen. And um, that pre-conference symposium really changed my life. It revitalized my passion for medicine and gave me hope that there are new modalities on the horizon that can really truly empower patients to heal and overcome musculoskeletal uh, injuries and disease. Um, so to that end, in 2021, I opened Integrated Spine Pain and Wellness here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and in fact, today is our two-year anniversary. Uh, the lights are still on and patients are still showing up, so uh, we're, we must be doing something right. But my practice has a heavy focus on regenerative medicine. In addition to all the regular interventional modalities, um, regenerative medicine has become a big part of my practice. So for me, like I said earlier, um, regenerative medicine truly revitalized my passion for medicine. Um, it's an exciting new field of medicine. It's constantly evolving. I mean, there's literally studies being done all over the world uh, on a daily basis. There's data being published and it really holds a lot of promise. And I think it is truly the future of medicine, especially with musculoskeletal and spine. So I wanna be focusing primarily on PRP. Uh, I think when you're first getting started with regenerative medicine, PRP is the easiest way to do this. Um, it's relatively simple. It involves a simple blood draw, taking the blood, spinning it in a centrifuge, separating out the different blood components. Um, and you'll learn more about that as you take courses in regenerative medicine and PRP. Uh, the FDA considers it safe um, as long as the PRP is used in a musculoskeletal, spine, or aesthetic space. So um, you'll be under the radar with regenerative modalities to stick with PRP in the beginning. Um, there's a very low risk for complications. Uh, usually complications are related to the procedure itself and the skill of the provider performing the procedure. Uh, side effects are minimal. The most common side effect with these PRP procedures is pain at the injection site. And for some, it can be rather uncomfortable, um, but there's no side effects to PRP. I tell my patients it's already floating around in your body. So if you haven't had a reaction to it already, you're gonna be just fine. Um, and we've learned through the years and through uh, numerous uh, studies that it is a safer alternative to corticosteroids. And when all else has failed, hyaluronic acid, uh, corticosteroid injections, 
there's a potential for better patient outcomes with PRP. So this report from Grandview Research estimated the global uh, regenerative market uh, size was valued at $7.34 billion and is expected to expand at a compounded annual growth rate of 11.5% from 2021 to 2028. So this is another benefit of adding regenerative medicine to your practice. It is in high demand. Patients are seeking these treatments. They are looking for alternatives to traditional medicine. And uh, this may be a good way for you to step into this field or a good time to step into this field. Um, then of course, there's also the added revenue source. So a lot of our uh, regenerative medicine procedures are not covered by insurance. Um, so we're not restricted to the limitations of insurance-based medicine. Um, also, when you incorporate regenerative medicine into your practice, you expand the range of services. You can attract new patients who are seeking out these therapies and you can increase your patient base and uh, revenue potential. It also, I feel, marks your uh, clinic as a forward thinking and innovative and it can potentially give you a competitive edge in the market. Um, in Phoenix, Arizona and Scottsdale, there's literally a pain doctor on every corner in this town. Um, a handful of us are doing regenerative medicine. Um, I feel only a smaller percentage of those people are doing it correctly and we'll learn about some of the techniques and uh, ways to optimize outcomes. As I mentioned earlier, uh, regenerative medicine may be a, a better option for patients who have failed more traditional modalities like hyaluronic acid injections and corticosteroid injections. There's robust data to support PRP over those treatments. And we had um, just really briefly a question that came in uh, asking, how do you explain the cash pay part um, to patients and how to pay for it? Yeah, so this actually took a little bit of time. I mean, as physicians, uh, we're not trained in the business side of medicine. So um, it wasn't until I started my own practice and started incorporating regenerative medicine into my practice where I had to have these conversations. Um, what I've learned to do over the last you know, couple of years is present it as a therapeutic option. So if someone comes in with knee osteoarthritis, I go over their options. Your options are a corticosteroid injection, uh, of course, always physical therapy and rehabilitation modalities, hyaluronic acid, and then PRP. And then I present the data and present the risks of uh, corticosteroids, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. And I use that to counsel patients. And then um, I inform them that it is a cash pay procedure. And I've been shockingly surprised at the number of patients that are willing to pay out of pocket for treatments, especially when we have such robust data to support it. That's great, thank you. Any other questions? Not right now. Okay. So errors are bad. <laughs> we have a lot of strong level one evidence studies that have shown that um, corticosteroids are what we call chondrotoxic. This study was published in JAMA in 2017, so several years ago, and is titled The Effective Intraarticular Triamcinolone Versus Saline on Knee Cartilage Volume and Pain in Patients with Knee Osteoarthritis. This is a two-year randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded trial of intraarticular triamcinolone versus saline for symptomatic knee osteoarthritis. So what the authors found was that over a two-year follow-up period, there was significantly decreased cartilage volume in the corticosteroid group versus a saline group with absolutely no improvement in pain. So they concluded that the, uh, their findings do not support the use of corticosteroids for patients uh, with symptomatic knee osteoarthritis. So a rather compelling article that was published in JAMA and shows that the effects of corticosteroids can be deleterious to the uh, joint space and cartilage. This study was uh, published in uh, the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in November of 2021. And this is titled Rapidly Destructive Hip Disease Following Intraarticular Corticosteroid Injection of the Hip. Now, this was a case control analysis designed to evaluate for an association between corticosteroid injections and rapidly destructive hip disease. What they found was that um, there was a dose response curve where the risk of rapidly destructive hip disease increasing with the number of injections as well as the injection dose. They found that at 5.1 months post injection, there was progressive joint space narrowing, osteolysis, and femoral head collapse. So um, while the risk of a single low-dose corticosteroid injection 
is low, the risk is much higher following high dose corticosteroids and repeated injections. So um, this is further information that we can use to counsel our patients about the risks associated with corticosteroid injections. And this also opens up the discussion uh, for PRP and regenerative medicine. So that's kind of how I've uh, been able to approach my patients with these cash pay services. They, they, want it, they want the data. Well, most do, at least my patient population, a lot of them like to read the articles. So uh, I've got PDFs of all these. And if anyone needs these references, I'm happy to send them uh, at a later date. But these are important studies. So this study was published in Arthroscopy in 2019, titled Intraarticular Injection of Platelet-Rich Plasma is Superior to Hyaluronic Acid or Saline in the Treatment of Mild to Moderate Knee Osteoarthritis. This was a level one study, randomized, double blind, triple parallel placebo controlled clinical trial. And what they did in this study is they gave a series of three PRP injections once a week versus saline and versus hyaluronic acid. They found that at one year there were significantly improved function and pain scores in the PRP group versus the saline group and even the hyaluronic acid group. So this study shows that there can be, uh, potentially be better outcomes in patients with knee osteoarthritis with PRP versus hyaluronic acid. Now this study was published in JAMA in November, 2021. And um, it was a very well-designed study, level one, um, it followed 140 patients for a year after receiving a series of three PRP injections one week apart versus saline injections one week apart. What they found at the end of their study at one year that, uh, is that there was no difference in outcome, improvement in pain or clinical outcome between the saline group and the PRP group. So they concluded that PRP is not an effective treatment for knee osteoarthritis. And this gained national uh, media attention. It was all over social media. Uh, the headlines were PRP doesn't work. And this actually surfaced here in um, my area as well. Um, there were, I've had several primary care specialists and even orthopedic specialists who uh, questioned my use of PRP on some of their patients. Had patients also uh, come to me with this information as well. But what we've learned um, is that Platelet dose matters and not all PRP is created equal. And this study really nailed the, put the nail in the coffin on this one. Um, these authors did a great job of describing their methodology. They did a 20 cc blood draw, which is more than even some of our uh, colleagues are doing in the community. They were able to generate five cc's of PRP. They quantified that the platelet count was raised from 271,000 per microliter to 325,000 per microliter. So that's still within human range. Uh, normal human platelet counts between 150 and 450,000 per microliter. So this is by anyone's standards considered a low dose PRP. So if you do the math, they delivered a total of 4.875 billion platelets over the course of three injections. Um, we know that low dose PRP doesn't work. And this is level one evidence that supports that low dose PRP doesn't work. So this is a pivotal study, um, probably good to be familiarized with this because I think a lot of practitioners out there are still using this to um, question what we're doing in the regenerative medicine space. I think it's just a lack of uh, awareness and uh, understanding. So what dose does matter? This study published in uh, uh, February, 2021, uh, came out of India, Dr. Bansal and his team, and this was another high-powered level one study, 150 patients. They were randomized to two different groups. One group, the control group, was uh, hyaluronic acid, a high molecular weight hyaluronic acid, uh, commercially known as monovisc. It was a 4cc injection. So 75 patients got the hyaluronic acid injection. The other 75 got a high-dose PRP injection. And they did a great job of quantifying their PRP. They did a 60cc blood draw. They were able to generate eight cc's of PRP with an approximate platelet count of 10 billion for the injection. And what they found was that at the end of one year, the PRP group did substantially better than the hyaluronic acid group in terms of Womack scores, VAS scores, and even walking distance. Um, the, this is a great article, so if you can uh, maybe screenshot this and look into it, it's fantastic. But the authors also did an um, analysis of the synovial fluid inside the joint, and they measured cytokines, including IL-6 and TNF-alpha, 
when they found it in the PRP group at one year, there was a substantial reduction in interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, suggesting that PRP may be disease modifying. Um, they also did MRI studies pre-procedure and then one year post-procedure. What they found is that there's, there was no difference in cartilage volume. So we call these regenerative medicine procedures, but PRP may not truly be regenerative, but we do know that it's chondroprotective and these MRI studies can support that. So not all PRP is created equal. So how do we optimize PRP outcomes? It's really important to invest in a high quality PRP collecting system and processing system. Um, not all PRP is created equal. Um, you want to stand, stand out from the rest of uh, your colleagues by always delivering the best quality possible. We've now come to realize that platelet dose does matter. And um, to obtain an effective uh, therapeutic dose of platelets, we need at least 60 cc's of blood. Patient selection is also very important when it comes to patient, uh, when it comes to outcomes with PRP. Um, we want patients who are motivated to invest in their health. Um, you know, my practice, I have a very strict pre and po uh, post procedure protocol. I have patients follow. Um, I actually email them this uh, protocol uh, in a PDF form, and I have them review this before they even decide if they want to do PRP because for some patients, I mean, I say out of a few hundred I've done over the last two years, only a few have decided that uh, the pre-procedure protocol was a little too rigorous for them. But that also, that's, a, that's a good thing because um, with these procedures, they can take time. Results aren't always immediate, like with corticosteroids. You may get immediate relief, may last a few months. Some of these procedures can take a few months to really take full effect. Um, it's important to really understand what patients are appropriate based on their medical history and social history. Uh, smokers aren't typically the healthiest people to begin with. Um, if we're considering doing a biological procedure, uh, I really don't want them inhaling carbon monoxide smoke several times a day. So, uh, you know, if they can quit smoking, great. But typically, if a patient's a smoker, I don't even have this conversation with them. Patients who are taking anticoagulants, if they're specifically on um, uh, anticoagulants that can affect platelet quality. Uh, they may not be the best candidates. Um, patients who have poorly controlled hypertension, uh, brittle diabetics, they also may not be the best candidates for this. Um, patients with advanced disease may also not be the best candidates for this. So I think when you're first getting started, stick to mild to moderate disease and try to find your healthier patients and the ones who are motivated to get better. Um, as uh, Dr. Chen says all the time, this stuff is in pixie dust. So it's important to set realistic expectations uh, for the treatment and outcomes. Um, this isn't gonna magically, magically regrow your cartilage, but it can have a profound anti-inflammatory um, effect. And we know it can be disease modifying and it may preserve the cartilage that's there. Um, also, we, we touched on this a little bit, uh, the financial viability of the patient is incredibly important. If this is something that patients have to save up for, or if it's going to strap them financially, this may not, they may not be the best people to uh, present these modalities to. Again, not all PRP is created equal. Uh, it's important that you invest in a high quality PRP kit and equipment and centrifuge. Uh, we've learned from numerous studies that a minimum of 60 cc's will should yield um, as close to 10 billion platelets as possible. So um, when you're considering int uh, introducing regenerative medicine into your practice, especially PRP, um, reach out to some of your colleagues and mentors and experts in the field and get some advice. Um, you want to start off uh, with a high quality system. That's where you're going to see the best results. And Dr. Goyle, we had a quick question related to that. With test tube kits, in your opinion, or low RPM spin times, do they still provide the platelet concentration needed for optimal results? Not according to the data that we have. And we can thank the uh, RESTORE trial that was published in JAMA in November 2021 for that. That's a very high power level one study that shows that low quality, low dose PRP is not effective. So um, the test tube regenerative medicine people out there, I would say uh, upgrade your kits and invest in a, in a better system. Okay, great. And we'll save the rest of the questions till you're finished up here. Okay. 
So pre and post procedure protocol. Um, I email patients a packet. It has uh, pre procedure recommendations as well as post procedure recommendations to help optimize outcome. It also helps me assess the uh, investment the patient is willing to put into their own health to really optimize these outcomes. Uh, diet's very important. Um, I tell patients when we're doing PRP, they're making the stuff that we're going to be injecting back into their body, so make it good. Uh, I tell them that they're the pharmaceutical company, so make me a good drug, one that's going to be effective. Um, it's really important that we have tight glycemic control and hypertension management and just management of uh, whatever comorbidities the patient may have. So those are all part of the pre-procedure protocol. And I'll get into, uh, a little bit more detail on that in the next few slides. I can't stress the importance of image guided injections. Um, I mentioned that my training was at Cleveland Clinic in 2006, 2007 in interventional spine and pain. Everything we did was fluoroscopic guided. Um, we had just gotten the first ultrasound machine. Um, this was towards the end of 2006. Dr. Samar Naruz, uh, extraordinary mentor of mine um, through the years, but he got the first ultrasound machine in our pain division. And he spent hours and hours studying uh, ultrasonographic anatomy. And he's written one of the foremost textbooks in ultrasound. The guy's just brilliant. But I can't stress the importance of having some kind of image guidance when you're doing these procedures. Uh, patients are paying cash for these. You want to make sure your needle tip is where you want it to be and the platelets are getting delivered where they need to be. So um, in my opinion, it's not an option to do these procedures without image guidance. Um, I recently had a patient who came to me, actually a few patients who've come to me who've had spinal PRP injections done and um, they said it didn't work and they're not fans of PRP and then you know you inquire a little bit uh, deeper into the situation and ask how these procedures were done. Um, Lauren this is uh, the test tube PRP kits that people are doing out there. I had one lady tell me she spent $17,000 on spinal PRP over the course of one year and she described the methods. It was a test tube the doctor would take the test tube, spin it, and then put the PRP, PRP in a syringe, and she would point to where she hurt, and he would inject no image guidance into those areas. So basically what she described to me was really expensive trigger point injections. So um, don't be that. Uh, use your training. Um, if you don't have training in image guidance, then please seek it out. There are many resources available. There are cadaver courses, there are ultrasound courses. Um, many of the experts in the field um, uh, teach ultrasound courses. So uh, there are resources available to you. Uh, I would say that if you're not familiar with image guided procedures, do not start doing these until you're comfortable with image guided procedures. Um, also, to optimize outcomes, you want to set realistic expectations for people. Um, mild to moderate osteoarthritis, we've learned from numerous studies that one injection per year may be all, ne all they need. So I would say if you're first starting off in regenerative medicine, stick to mild to moderate osteoarthritis. Um, through the years, I've been treating advanced osteoarthritic patients as well. Uh, typically, in my practice, I found that a series of three um, tends to yield optimal outcomes. Uh, tendon injuries, which we're not going to talk about in this talk, but they may require one to three treatments depending on the extent of injury. Now we'll talk about some of the pre and post procedure protocols that I like to implement for uh, PRP. The biggest component of this is the pre procedure protocol. Like I said, I tell patients they're making the stuff that I'm going to be injecting into their injured area or the area that we're going to treat. So please make it good. Um, in my practice, we focus on an anti-inflammatory or Mediterranean diet. This is a diet that's low in processed food, um, low in refined sugars, um, vegetable-based primarily, uh, rich with uh, good fats and lean meats. So all of these can optimize plasma and outcome, and they're just good for your patient overall. I like patients at least the week before to start to hydrate adequately. And so I tell them drink half their weight in uh, half, their, half their body weight in ounces per day, and this can help increase and improve hydration as well as plasma volume. Um, I stress sleep hygiene and stress management through meditation and mindfulness. That's a big component of our practice as well. This all helps empower the patient to really get in tune with themselves and take control of their health and be invested in the outcome. 
Uh, a week before the procedure, I'll have patients do some type of aerobic activity as tolerated. I recommend um, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour of aerobic uh, activity daily leading up to the blood draw. So um, this can include walking, even walking in the neighborhood, hiking, uh, stationary bike. Um, I have some athletes I take care of, so I just have them do their normal workouts, but include aerobic activity as well. This can reduce cortisol, help manage blood pressure, and uh, you know just promote a healthier state of being. Um, I have patients discontinue all NSAID medications two weeks prior to treatment. Most NSAIDs have an adverse effect on platelets. Uh, we want optimally functioning platelets when we do these procedures, so I recommend discontinuing anti-inflammatory medications two weeks prior. Uh, also, hypertension optimization and glucose optimization is key, and sometimes I'll work with the primary care specialist if the patient is struggling to come up with a plan, maybe adjust some of the medications to uh, better manage their comorbidities. Post-procedure. So post-procedure can be very uncomfortable. I actually um, did a, a rather large case yesterday and um, a patient messaged me today that she had a hard time sleeping through the night. Um, so post-procedural discomfort can be pretty significant the first uh, two to three days post-procedure. So this is rest and recovery. I like patients not to work if possible and definitely no exercising. Um, it's kind of a take it easy, you know, you get a hall pass for the weekend or whatever, uh, just to rest and recover. Days four to seven, if they're feeling up to it, they can introduce their activities of daily living as tolerated. Um, if patients are working, I may have them take a Friday off and do the procedure on a Friday. They can return to work on Monday. Um, I do have some patients who have flown in from other parts of the country to see me. Uh, I had a lady last week came in from Michigan. Um, I saw her on Monday. We did her procedure on Wednesday after about a six week uh, initial consultation via email with the pre-procedure packet and everything. And she was fine to fly home Sunday. So um, I wouldn't encourage that for everyone, but uh, you know, you have to basically um, cater your post-procedure protocol for each individual patient. Um, typically between weeks one and three, I'll have patients uh, restart or begin a physical therapy and rehabilitation program. Uh, and again, I have them refrain from anti-inflammatory medications for at least two weeks post-procedure. Um, the longer the better because we want the playlist to function optimally. And in many situations, we need an inflammatory response to trigger the platelets to degranulate and uh, create the healing cascade. Smoking is bad. Um, like I said, I don't offer these therapies to my smokers. Um, I've had a couple of patients who've talked to me about um, wanting regenerative medicine who are smokers. Uh, I told them I wouldn't do it. They went elsewhere, came back very disappointed because they didn't get any better. But, um, you know, if I were to have a smoker, I would recommend smoking cessation for at least two months before doing the blood draw and then refraining from cigarette use for an additional four to six months post procedure, just so there's no impedance of the uh, healing process. Um, alcohol, I typically have patients abstain from alcohol one week before the blood draw and then one week post procedure. Again, alcohol can have an effect on platelets that can be adverse. So to optimize outcomes, um, we limit alcohol use, at least for the week before and week after. Physical therapy and rehabilitation is a key component to the post-procedure uh, process. Um, I am networked with some of the most extraordinary physical therapists in the area, and uh, they've helped me tremendously. Um, you know, when we do these procedures, it's a team effort. It begins with the primary care specialists or the referring physicians. It continues through me, and then it goes on to the physical therapists as well. And uh, physical therapy is typically geared at keeping the patient active. We want to avoid any further injury and we want to rehabilitate the injury that was uh, the area that was injured or the area that we're treating. Um, it's important to promote proper body mechanics too. When patients have these procedures, they may have increased pain. They may be altering their body mechanics, which can create dysfunction in other parts of their body. Um, so I rely heavily on my physical therapist to assist with that. Um, if you have professional athletes or uh, weekend warriors or, or people who were, I call them worker outers, people who work out regularly, lift weights, I, I just tell them to stop. Um, if you're seeing a personal trainer, I have them stop as I have them stop seeing their personal trainer. I have them see the physical therapist and use the physical therapist as their personal trainer for a specific um, 
focused rehabilitation and they can incorporate that stuff into their daily routine and workouts and then usually around six to eight weeks they can start introducing their um, their strength training and uh, more aggressive workouts as tolerated Um, again, cold is also something I have patients avoid. Uh, we have a lot of patients who are now doing these cold plunges, which um, may have some longevity benefits and recovery benefits. But when we're doing these PRP procedures, we don't want to impede blood flow. So ice can reduce inflammation, cause vasoconstriction, and that's the opposite of what we want post-procedure. So I'll encourage patients to use uh, heat, either a heating pad for 15 to 20 minutes or a hot pack to the affected area. Um, anywhere from uh, every one to three hours as needed. And they can do that for the first few days. And this can also um, help with post-procedure discomfort and then promote blood flow and oxygenation to the area as well. So um, I believe that is pretty much uh, all I have for the post-procedure protocol. And so um, hopefully you've gotten a little glimmer of what the uh, possibilities and potentials are with adding regenerative medicine to your practice. Um, it's, I, for me, it's been a tremendous modality. Um, I'm having patients uh, daily inquire about these procedures and come to see me to have these discussions and to determine if uh, this therapy might be right for them. So it can really set your practice aside from other practices in your area and increase your patient base and also serve as an additional revenue source. Um, hopefully you've learned that PRP quality matters. Uh, there are numerous studies, more than what I presented here, and I'm happy to send you references to review, but uh, we've learned that platelet dose is critical and you need a minimum dose for this to be effective. So you wanna start with an effective dose and uh, we've learned that that's 60 cc's of blood um, or more. And then, um, you know, with the changing climate of healthcare and reimbursements, um, this can be an added revenue source and uh, allow sustainability in your clinic. Um, an insurance carrier recently sent me an updated addendum to my contract, dropping my um, rate from 90% of Medicare to 77% of Medicare. Um, that's completely unacceptable. I don't know if anyone else is facing those types of cuts, but that's not sustainable, um, especially when you wanna deliver high quality care. Uh, for me, I enjoy spending time with my patients and connecting with them. I get to know them on a somewhat personal basis because I feel, you know, when we do these procedures, we're intimately connected and I'm invested in their outcome as much as they are. So um, this is one way that my practice is growing and evolving. And, um, you know, I think that the future of medicine is going to be regenerative medicine and the future of medicine is going to be taking back healthcare from insurance companies. So this is me. You can reach me at my email here. There's my website. Uh, I have an Instagram page, a YouTube page. Uh, we have a TikTok floating around there somewhere and there's a podcast as well. So um, I'm very accessible. Email is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, but um, if you found this useful, like and follow us on Instagram. I think that's what people say, or just follow us on YouTube as well. And uh, that's all I got. So I'll open it up to uh, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Goyo. Yeah, we had a couple questions come in. Uh, one person did want to get a list of the articles or a reference list via email. So I'll be sure to um, get those sent out to everybody that's registered for the webinar. Um, okay. Obviously, Dr. Goyle had provided his information um, to use as a reference as well, but we certainly will get that out to everyone. Um, is there a particular resource on image guidance that you would suggest as a good place to start? Um, yeah, there are some fantastic textbooks uh, on ultrasound guided procedures, um, also fluoroscopic guided procedures. Um, I have some right behind me. Um, Pain Procedures in Clinical Practice, Atlas of Ultrasound Guided Musculoskeletal Injections. Uh, I have a few others too, but I'm happy to pass those references on. Um, that's a good place to start, but I still would take a course. Um, there's ultrasound courses. There, uh, Army puts on a fantastic uh, conference uh, two or three times a year, and there's always a pre-course uh, ultrasound guided uh, uh, course that you can take. So. Um, that's a great resource as well, but you definitely want to get hands-on experience. I mean, you can read in the book, great, but you really want to get the feel 
and really understand uh, and learn from the experts uh, before you start doing these procedures. But uh, I'm happy to email a link of the, uh, of the references for the textbooks and also some courses that you can take because um, uh, they're, they're happening all the time. So. Excellent. And we can probably include some of that whenever we're sending the articles out. So right. thank you for that. Um, we did have someone ask if mixing hyaluronic acid functions as a scaffold for platelet-rich plasma, and if yes, does this benefit benefit the patient? Yeah, you know there have been studies that have shown that a combination of hyaluronic acid and PRP can be very effective. Um, the Bansal study shows that PRP by itself is superior to hyaluronic acid. Um, I'm a personally a fan of hyaluronic acid. There's data to support using it. I think the combination is a great way to go. Um, I do that with several of my patients. I have a combination of uh, PRP with hyaluronic acid, as long as it's the high molecular weight hyaluronic acid. Okay, great. Uh, we also had somebody ask if you are, well, since regeneration and pain control can't be correlated by a validated measure, are you assessing regeneration in a joint? And if yes, how are you doing so? I'm actually not, re re uh, sorry, I'm not assessing regeneration. Um, it's more pain and function. So Womac, VAS, and then physical activity levels. That's that's how I'm assessing my patients. Um, I'm not doing um, repeat MRIs at one year or um, that. I mean, it's really not indicated, um, but studies have shown, the Bansal study out of India, which is a landmark study, showed that at one year, there was no change in cartilage volume according to the 3T MRI studies. So um, while these procedures, the PRP procedures may not be truly regenerative, they are, um, proving to be counterprotective. Okay. Uh, we had somebody else send something in saying that we know corticosteroids are destructive and you showed a great landmark paper. Given we have PRP, bone marrow concentrate, MFAT, even prolotherapy and hyaluronic acid, how can any of us in good conscience offer any steroid therapy going forward? That is a great question. I, you know, I think that we take this oath to do no harm. Steroids are bad. They just are, they're toxic. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our patients um, have to go through their insurance and they don't have the cash pay option for these regenerative medicine procedures. So we're kind of limited to that. But um, I think the paradigm is gonna shift. Uh, I, you know, we're still heavily governed by insurance companies that follow antiquated guidelines that, you know, are not based on any science. Uh, procedures we've been doing for decades have been deemed experimental, even with robust data to support their use and outcomes. But um, here we have a strong data that supports uh, discontinuing the use of corticosteroids, especially in the joint space. Um, to that end, one thing I do is I use non-particulate corticosteroids. Uh, this may have less of a, a harmful effect to the joint space. So I'll use dexamethasone as opposed to triamcinolone or uh, methylprednisolone. Um, that may be another way around this, but uh, to answer the question, no, it's 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 harmful, and I think that um, over time, hopefully, we'll see a paradigm shift. I'm already starting to see um, orthopedic surgeons who are referring me patients uh, with uh, you know moderate to advanced knee osteoarthritis, specifically for PRP or HA. And they're telling their patients bypass the corticosteroid injections because of the potential harm. So I think um, over the next several years, we'll see a shift. And uh, this is another reason to incorporate regenerative medicine into your practice. Uh, you know, you want to be ahead of the paradigm shift, be, uh, be cutting edge, be on the frontier of this stuff. And building on that, we had someone ask if you inject PRP in the epidural space in place of steroids. I do. Yes, Lucas, I pour PRP. I do um, probably do in spine cases at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And uh, I can I can go over some of my protocols on that as well. But yeah, I mean, I do cervical epidurals. I do uh, transforaminals, caudal epidurals, all with leukocyte poor PRP. Okay, and when you go back to that initial blood draw, um, when you're looking at that 60 cc blood draw, what type of joints are you going to be using that? Um, and to further that, specifically elbow, hand, foot, and then spine and hip. Um, all of it. That's the minimum blood draw I do for any procedure I do. So 60 cc's is the absolute minimum. So um, 
you know, if, uh, if I do a 60 cc blood draw, I can concentrate, you know, anywhere from six to eight C's of high quality PRP. And so in a hip, I would use six CC's in a knee. Um, the knee is rather forgiving. I mean, you know, we've had joint effusions where you can drain, you know, you know, 40, 50, 60 CC's of fluid. So um, I'll use eight CC's typically in a knee joint. Um, I'm not injecting fingers or hands. Uh, I just think it's incredibly painful. I do offer sedation for some of my patients, but um, I'm not doing hands and wrists right now. Uh, I stick mainly, uh, mainly to knees. Uh, I'll do ankles. I'll do uh, tendons throughout the entire body, knees, hips, uh, shoulders, elbows, and then facet joints throughout the spine as well. Have you, uh, going to post-procedure protocol, have you seen failure due to exercising too soon? A hundred percent. I have a guy, he's an amazing guy. He's, uh, he had a rotator cuff tendinopathy, treated him. Uh, we did a series of three high quality PRP injections under ultrasound, uh, directed at the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscap tendons. And, um, 77, incredibly fit, but, uh, He'd been working out wrong, and so he developed this tendinopathy. It was impeding his ability to work out. And so post-procedure, he was supposed to reach out to my physical therapist and, uh, and follow a protocol. Well, I saw him for a three-month follow-up, and he said for the first two months post-procedure, he had 100% pain relief for the first time in over a year, was very happy. But over the last month, he digressed significantly. So I examined him. He appeared to have rotator cuff tendinopathy. Um, we repeated the MRI, his tendinopathy had actually worsened and, uh, he was a little disappointed. I was very disappointed because, uh, you know, I want my patients to have good outcomes, but then he revealed to me that he didn't do physical therapy. He went right back to the workouts he was doing that caused the ori original injury. So I sent him to my, to a physical therapist, uh, colleague of mine who immediately the first day he evaluated him said, he's doing his bicep curls completely wrong. And he's stressing out his rotator cuff. He's like, I'm correcting this. Let's see how he does over the next two months. So yeah, um, patients really need to follow the post-procedure protocol. Um, that's just one case. Uh, most of my patients are doing very well and most are really committed. You know, um, it's fun taking care of patients who are weekend warriors, athletes, and uh, people who work out regularly, but they can also be some of the most difficult to manage post-procedure because they are wanting immediate results and they want to get right back to what they were doing before. And there's a lot of coaching that's involved there. Um, you know, I, I tell them it's six to 12 weeks. You got to really stick with the physical therapy program to optimize outcomes. We've had a couple people ask questions about cost um, of PRP. I'm assuming that's something that's regional um, Absolutely. and maybe something that if, if they wanted to get in touch with you about something like that, I think there's going to be a lot of variance. There is for sure. Um, you've got to look at number one, the cost of the kits. You got to look at your time involved. For me, patients are paying for my time. Um, when I do these cash pay procedures, I don't put them in my lineup of my insurance-based procedures. These are cash pay procedures. I give patients a concierge experience. Um, I'd say about 30% of my patients have my cell phone number. Uh, all my PRP patients get my email, the same email I, I presented here. And um, I want them invested. I want to be a resource for them. They're paying cash for these procedures. And uh, yeah, I would really look at all those factors, um, determine what level of, qual of service you wanna provide, uh, see what other people in the community in your local area are charging for these procedures. Um, there are people in the area charging substantially less than I am, and they're doing the 20 cc test tube kits, right? So um, I guess you get what you pay for, um, but definitely um, see what the climate is like in your community and uh, if you want some further advice, you can reach out to me. But really, it comes down to time. I mean, for my spine procedures, I book those for two hours. I take my time with those. There's no other patients here when I'm doing those. Typically, for my joints and tendon injections, I book those for an hour. I want those patients to also have that concierge experience where there's not a lineup of pe people waiting to, you know, have four to six injections per hour. So um, you have to factor all of those. It's, it's you know... Uh, it's, it can be a complicated formula, but uh, over time, uh, you know, I've, I've found what works for me in my practice. 
All right, we had something else that came in. Um, somebody would like to know if you think platelet poor plasma has some value or do you throw it away? No, I actually use the platelet poor plasma because it can stimulate myocyte activity. There's some studies that have shown that it could be beneficial for myocytes. So um, if I have, so I've had patients with bad rotator cuff tears, muscle atrophy. These are patients who are older, not candidates for surgery for whatever reason. So in those patients, I will use the platelet poor plasma and I will do trigger point injections. I don't charge extra for that. So um, I had made a comment about expensive trigger point injections. I'm actually treating the pathology that's there with a high quality PRP, but I will use the platelet poor plasma for trigger point injections. Same thing with my spine cases. I'll take 10 to 12 cc's of platelet poor plasma off the top. And um, I'll use that for trigger point injections in the multifidus muscles, iliacostalis muscles, longissimus thoracis muscles, some of the stable, uh, supporting gluteal muscles as well. Um, so I, I like to use it all. I hate to throw away any, anyone's plasma. The red blood cells get thrown away, but um, I try to utilize most of the plasma. Great. Um, and lastly, have you used shockwave therapy in combination with any of I have not, but there is, there is some data to support it. So I do have a, a provider here locally, a physical medicine specialist who's extraordinary, and I will refer him some of my post-procedural patients for shockwave therapy because that can be regenerative. So it can enhance what we've done. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation in the webinar tonight. And thank you, Dr. Goyle, for sharing your expertise and passion for regenerative medicine. Um, thanks again for joining us and everyone have a fantastic evening. We will get those emails out to you that have uh, the links for the articles. Great. Thank you. Thank you.